Okay, so middle of page 17. Um, so I think I've mentioned this to you guys already, but I worked for 10 years at Redeemer New York City. And Tim Keller, as our pastor, is also a very influential thought leader. And he's given a tremendous amount of thought to how Christians engage culture. And I think part of that was because he was in the epicenter of cultural formation for North America. And you might say for the world, New York produces a lot of culture that the world consumes. So he's done a lot of thinking on the topic of culture and it's been very impactful to me. I don't really know how to approach scripture as relates to cultural engagement without thinking of all the things that I've learned from Tim and from my time at Redeemer. I do think, of course, Christians need to continue thinking about these topics because culture changes and the world changes. But nonetheless, I've been very formed by my experience there. So Tim took Niebuhr's five-fold model, and what he did is he broke it down into four. So what I want to do is walk with you through the four. We're going to map them to Niebuhr's, and then we're going to look at a grid that helps us, I think, as the brothers in the back said, understand how all of these ways of engaging with the culture can be both biblical but also not biblical. So here's Tim's fourfold summary of Niebuhr's fivefold model. First, he calls the transformationist model, which is an emphasis on Christians pursuing their vocations from a Christian worldview and thereby changing the culture. So emphasis there on vocation. We're going to talk a lot about vocation tomorrow. But as you hear me say that, where do you think that maps to Niebuhr's fivefold approach? What does the transformationist model relate to Niebuhr's language? Right, Christ transforming culture, and what else? There's one other. Christ above culture, that's right. So you can put within the transformationist model Niebuhr's number five and Niebuhr's number three. Okay? The two kingdoms model is in some ways a little complicated, but it's also one of the most common ways that Christians think. It's the idea that God rules all of creation through common kingdom in which all people operate by natural revelation. And there's also the redemptive kingdom in which Christians are ruled by special revelation. You might think here of a distinction between church and state. The way the church is meant to be run and governed and led is not necessarily the same way the state is meant to be led and governed and run. Where does this map to Niebuhr? Yes, Christ and culture and paradox. So that's Niebuhr's number four. Flip the page, you see the relevance model. The animating idea here is that God's spirit is at work in the culture to further God's kingdom. So Christians should view culture as their ally and join with God in doing good in and through culture. Where does that map to Niebuhr? Of culture, number two. And then of course, and now we've eliminated all other options, the countercultural model, James's model. Here the focus is how the church, the community of faith, is in contrast and distinction from society. So this is Niebuhr's number one, Christ against culture. Do you see how Tim has done that? He's broken up the four into uh, these, uh, really these ideas from Niebuhr. Now do you see this chart? Do you guys have this? Are you looking at this the, in your packet? So this is right out of the book Center Church. Uh, it's mostly readable, I think, but if not, you can grab a copy of Center Church. What I love about what Tim has done in this chart, and we'll spend a few minutes looking at it and talking about it, is he shows us that there are biblical and unbiblical ways to live out each of these approaches to cultural engagement. So if you think about the relevance model, the most extreme form of it would be something like liberation theology. Somebody mentioned the word social gospel. That's kind of like liberation theology. It's a little different. But liberation theology in its most extreme form, which originated in Latin America, now has a lot of presence here, I believe, in parts of Africa. I know Africa's huge, but um, different parts, certainly sub-Saharan too. Uh, liberation theology in its most extreme is saying the essence of salvation is liberation from oppressive power structures. So economic justice is salvation. Liberation from oppressors is salvation. It's taking seriously 
stories like the book of Exodus, that the way God brings his people into freedom is by overthrowing the yoke of those who are uh, oppressing them. So at its most extreme form, someone who is seeking relevance in culture to sort of the utmost degree is to so blend Christian theology with uh, social change that you see them as one and the same. That the real goal of the gospel is to bring uh, uh, liberation from evil or from oppression in, in, in human and physical terms. Yeah. Interestingly, I would say that almost falls just under the category of sin. So in other words, what, what we're talking about here is ways that Christians are trying to engage with the culture. If someone is participating in activity that would be sinful in the sense of like, um, you know, movies are complicated because of stuff that's going on in them, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But for example, um, to, to be blunt, like if a movie's filled with graphic sex or something like that, and a Christian's like, oh, I'm just being relevant, I'd say, no, you're probably just being a little sinful. Like there's a worldliness there that isn't the same as like good Christian cultural engagement. The people in the relevance category, if we want to give them the benefit of the doubt, are trying to take scripture seriously, but their understanding of scripture is that the ultimate apex of, of, uh, of Christian discipleship is to see the culture reflect, um, uh, is, to, is to sort of, uh, to bring to this world the kingdom in such a way that, you know, the world is shaped by, th that the, uh, the ultimate example of salvation is the kind of liberation that we would hope to see uh, and that we've seen in stories like the Exodus. So I would just pick them a little different. The, um, it's almost an accommodationist model, but it's a sinful accommodationist model, what you just described. Yeah. Other questions about the relevance model? So what I would say simply is that they, and speaking as favorably as I can for people in the liberation theology camp, they would see Christ as the champion of the oppressed. So their eschatology, their New Testament theology is very much directed towards Christ as the one who brings about liberation from oppressors, Christ as the one who champions economic justice, Christ as the one who stands up for the marginalized. So for them, gospel is the uh, renewal of broken social systems, you know, at its most extreme. Is that, am I addressing your question? So I would say, without wanting to speak too authoritatively in the sense that I don't know exactly where your friend's coming from, I would actually say that what he's describing is more in the, the, what you, the, the blended insights part of this, of this chart, which is absolutely. The gospel does speak to social ills. The gospel does speak to social injustices. And we want to see, as the gospel goes forward, people who are hurt, marginalized, oppressed, liberated from those sorts of things, but not ever understanding that to be the full ultimate goal of Christ's redemptive work. It's part of it, but it's not all of it, and it's not maybe the main part of it. So I would say if someone's talking about the importance of working for social change, but under the umbrella of the fact that we do all of that because Christ died to defeat sin, to usher, he defeated the devil, he's bringing in his new kingdom, and we work in light of that, that to me seems like we're in the blended insights part of the relevance wing of this graph. So, so let's just look a little more at the graph. So on the wings, horizontally, you see the relevance and uh, transformationist uh, uh, sections would be active in influencing culture. These are people who are involved in the world. They're paying attention to what's happening in the world. They have friendships. They have jobs that are in the world, and they're active. They're engaged. The, transform in, uh, the transformationist uh, uh, group would believe, would, would, would de-emphasize common grace, which we'll define in just a little bit. But the relevance category would be full of common grace, that anything that's good or working towards human flourishing needs to be embraced and celebrated, okay? The two kingdoms model um, is basically the idea that Christians live in two realms and are governed by different uh, charters, you might say, in those two realms. So what Christians believe as what a church should be and the, how the community of faith is governed is different from how the state should be governed. So here you would have, as an example, a Christian who says, I believe that the Bible says marriage is for one person, uh, for one person, one man and one woman, but it's not for Christians to legislate what the state says about marriage. That's a civil matter. Now, there's a lot of disagreement about this. I'm giving you an extreme example. Um, so that's, the, that's like a, two, a version of two kingdoms in a very extreme way 
that what governs the church is not necessarily the same thing that governs the state. So what you have there is we're more passive and we're very, we're very influential in the church community, but we're not as concerned with influencing culture because that's a different realm. Um, but full of common grace in the sense that we believe God is working in the common realm, natural law, natural revelation, et cetera. And the counterculturalist model, which is basically <laughs> culture is bad and we gotta stay away. So stay with your community of faith, uh, don't be tempted or tainted by sin, um, and sort of just hold on till heaven. The Amish, uh, while there's a lot to be commended with the Amish, honestly, there's, uh, they're the extreme version of this, that you know, they almost try to build a society in which there's zero penetration from the world into their community um, because of fear that culture is bad. Yeah, so the two, the two kingdoms model is meant to guide how Christians use their faith to engage in the culture. So it, it's a way of saying to Christians, what governs your spiritual life, your practice as a Christian, should not necessarily be imposed onto the state or onto the culture around you. So in other words, um, I'll just use another political example. Christians believe that, uh, uh, <clears throat> um, so a more uh, controversial example. Christians believe that marriage um, uh, conception, a child's life begins at conception. So abortion would therefore be wrong. But some Christians in the two kingdoms camp would say something like, I believe that, and Christians are called to believe that, and my church is called to teach that, but it's not for me to impose or to demand that the state shares my view that the state makes abortion illegal because I, as a Christian, believe abortion is wrong. The opposite of that, and this is why the chart is so helpful, come down to the transformationist model. So what you have in the transformationist model are people who believe that faith should impact everything about the world, including their political positions. So this is why you have here the religious right, which is a distinctly American thing. Do you know what the religious right is? Have you ever heard of it? It's basically an attempt to model the governing structures of the American political system by Christian theology and Christian values. So there would be people who would say, abortion is wrong because God says it is, therefore it should be illegal in our land. And so what has happened in America is there's been a move to, you might say, couple the church and Christian teaching with a political party. So that's, again, a kind of extreme version of the transformationist model. Yes, yeah, so, but let's, yes, 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 but don't use the word secular simply because the two kingdoms people aren't saying that God isn't part of the, the common kingdom. They're saying he rules the common kingdom differently than he rules the redemptive kingdom. So we should still, so many two kingdoms advocates would say we should work for anti-abortion laws because of things like natural law and things like common grace and things like uh, you know, what makes for healthy family life and healthy, you know. so they would still be very much influenced by Christian teaching, but they wouldn't be saying that this must pass as a policy because X verse and chapter and Bible says so and so. So it isn't that for two kingdoms people, it isn't that, um, you know, uh, for, for many of them anyway, it isn't that the common kingdom is secular as much as it is to say um, we have to appeal to the things that God has given uh, in natural revelation as the way in which we, we work for good or we work for change. Make sense? It's a good question. Yeah, kind of, yeah. So like there's certain things that we know in the church because we've been saved by Jesus, renewed by the Spirit, we believe God's ultimate revelation is in Christ. But if that's not someone's ultimate authority, Christians still believe that we live in God's world and God's given natural law, God's given our consciences, God's given um, things in human society that help humans flourish, and those would be the basis of appeal, right? So that's why you have a lot of people who aren't Christian who would still be arguing or working for Christian themes because of common grace and common revelation, uh, natural revelation. Well, <laughs> Let me answer that question like this. Look at the chart. Where, where was Jesus? <laughs> right in the middle. It's a silly question. But so 
the goal of Christian discipleship is actually to be right in the center of this circle and therefore recognizing that temperamentally, and I said this earlier, right? Temperamentally, some of us are like, culture sucks, you know, and, and you want to avoid it. Others are like, culture's the best, and you want to accommodate it. And we all need to be discipled into the model of Jesus, which is right in the middle, which recognizes, yeah, we can be worldly influenced, and that's dangerous. But we also are called to serve and to make disciples in this world, so we have to be engaged. We can't fully dislike. But at the same time, I, for one, don't want there to be... Uh, I don't want politicians to be legislate, le, you know, legislated by, you know, uh, Christian values in the sense that I wouldn't want that for other religions, right? I wouldn't want another religion to have all force and power. I want there to be some freedom and plurality. Um, if you say, is that biblical? Of course it is. Remember when Peter comes to Jesus and was like, should we pay taxes? Jesus is like, give me the coin. Whose image is on there? Like, yeah, pay your taxes, but give to God what is God's. I mean, Jesus understood there were political systems, and even though he's the king of heaven, he's submitting to them, and he's participating in them. So the point is that there's extremes of all these things that are negative and bad, but real discipleship is actually to be shaped by all of them for the best parts while living in this sort of center where we do have, look at the center. We work for humble excellence in our world. We're not triumphalistic. We work for the common good. We want people, even people who aren't Christians, to experience the fullness of God's kingdom. We want to have a distinctive worldview. We want our worldview to shape the way we work and the way we contribute to culture. But we also want to be different. We want to stand out. We want to be salt, which is, you know, like some of you guys use the, um, the, the you know, when you're talking about like Christ against culture is not good because God calls us to be salt and light. Well, actually, the Amish are very... You know, the, the problem is they're not engaged enough, but they have a very distinct culture, which makes them stand out as followers of Jesus, at least in a certain sense. So we want to we wanna stand out. We want to be different. We want to be a community in which people look at the church and they're like, wow, they use sex, money, and power totally differently than the rest of our society. So that's a, that's a counterculture, you know. Uh, that's a counterculture model. So real discipleship as it relates to cultural engagement is going to be living in that circle recognizing that people have temperaments that pull them in one direction or the other. Churches have temperaments that pull them in one direction or the other. And healthy discipleship isn't going full tilt in that way. It's actually being drawn back in by uh, the other aspects of Christian cultural engagement. It wouldn't be that hard to come up with scriptural references to support each of these grids, each of these boxes. So therefore, we want to be shaped by all of scripture. Okay, let's see here. Um, so here's what we're going to do now. Um, I want to talk for you with, with you. So this is page 18. We're going to shift gears a tiny bit because this is something we haven't talked about, but we need to, is what's called common grace. So um, all of this conversation about cultural engagement really relies on a healthy definition of common grace. So we want to spend just a few minutes talking about it. Before we look at the handout, any attempts at describing or defining what common grace is. I don't know if you guys have already studied it this year, but how would you define or describe what is common grace? Good. So <clears throat> to, to summarize what you're saying, the ways in which all people, including those who don't identify as Christians, experience goodness in, a world, in this world is an example of God's common grace. Is that fair? I think you're right. One of my favorite verses in the Bible about common grace is um, Matthew 5, when Jesus is talking about loving your enemies. And Jesus says, even God sends his reign on the just and the unjust. And what that is about is Jesus saying, even people who are evil receive good from the hand of God. And that's an example of common grace. It's God's goodness flowing into the world even and especially to people who don't obey him, who don't love him, who don't follow him. But more than that, common grace is even Christians enjoying this world and the beauty it offers. So when you sit down to enjoy a really good meal, the fact that God made you with taste buds, the fact that God made people know how to cook well, is itself a sign of common grace. So it isn't the case that only non-Christians experience common grace. 
Everyone experiences common grace. The wonder is that non-Christians do too. Make sense? So let's take a look at some of these definitions. Common grace is every favor of whatever kind or degree falling short of salvation, which this undeserving and sin-cursed world enjoys at the hand of God. That's from John Murray. Murray goes on to say that there are two ways in which common grace manifests itself. One is restraint, the idea that human beings are not nearly as terrible as they should otherwise be. <laughs> Some are. But the idea is that part of common grace work in the world is that God is restraining evil. He's keeping it at bay. He's holding the forces of chaos at, in check so that the world is not as terrible or as bad as it could be or should be in rebellion to God. But another way that common grace manifests itself is what's called the bestowal of good, that not only does God restrain evil, but he fills the world with beauty. He fills the world with goodness. Uh, this is where I think Christians who are against culture in a very extreme way have a deficient theology. One of my favorite quotes in, in, in this topic is Calvin in the Institutes. Calvin says, there is not one blade of grass which God has not given to make us say and to feel rejoice. I think that's right. There's not even a blade of grass on this planet that's not meant to give joy to someone. Every part of creation is infused with the creative beauty of God. Now, some of that, as we'll talk about in a little bit, is tainted by sin. But the idea here is that by virtue of God's bestowal of good and common grace, almost anything that's beautiful, almost anything that reflects love and joy and peace and goodness should drive us back to God. Bavink, your Bavink, Herman Bavink, used to say, God is the beauty to which all the beauties point. And so the reason you respond to art and music and painting and good food and a little kid laughing, the reason our hearts are moved by beauty is because God made beauty and God is beautiful and he puts beauty in the world to lead us to him. So the bestowal of good and common grace is a challenge to anyone who would say, I'm against culture. The challenging thing is when art or movies or culture has beauty and sin in it. You know, that's when they get tough. A movie, um, an influencer who's really cool and looks great and like, wow, they're so stylish, but does bad things then how do we wrestle with that? How do we embrace that? How do we experience it? That's, we'll talk about that. But the point here is simply to say, to be anti-culture is a deficient theology because it fails to take into account the fact that God has poured out his goodness over all creation. And that's so much, like when you read the Old Testament, what are the signs of God's blessing? Like when God blesses his people, what does he do? Food, rain you know, natural stuff that makes this world flourish. Um, the, the promised land is not a land with like tons of hymnals and, you know, like a really great music uh, team. The promised land is a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a place where you have really yummy food that nourishes but also delights. This is common grace. So we want to be challenged from our anti-culture perspectives by the reality of common grace but we also want to be shaped by the presence of sin, which keeps us from a full embrace of culture. Let me read to you this last bit from Murray, which unpacks some of these things, but especially you know, from my background, and again, I recognize I come from a different, very different ministry context, but this quote from Murray, I would say, is very fundamental for how I try to disciple Christians in a place like London or uh, the way we did in New York. Maybe you will disciple people in these ways too. If you have an awareness of common grace as both restraining of evil but bestowal of good, Murray says this awareness produces a respect for and an appreciation of every good and noble thing. It is this philosophy and ethic that has made Christianity in its true expression a force in every department of legitimate human interest and vocation. So just pause there. What he means is this. Christians should be the best scientists in the world. Why? Because we believe God made the world. 
So if science is an attempt to understand how the world works, we should be the best scientists ever, right? The Christians should be the best historians ever because we believe history is God's story and we should be paying attention to it as such, right? So that Christians who really understand common grace should be leading in every legitimate human interest and vocation. Christianity, when true to its spirit, has not been ascetic or monastic. You guys know what those terms mean? Ascetic is like um, the desert fathers, like we're gonna go off to the desert and suffer and isolate from culture because the essence of true spirituality is like suffering and isolating. Uh, monastic, you know, like we're gonna pull away from the culture, we're going to pray and be in a small, tight-knit community. Murray's saying that's actually never been the real spirit of Christianity. Now, let me be clear. I do think that there can be moments and seasons in a person's life where you might say a monastic tendency could be helpful. Pulling away, retreating, days of solitude, prayer, absolutely. Fasting, really very significant. But what he's saying is that when the apex of spiritual life is monasticism or asceticism, that doesn't seem to align with an understanding of common grace. Rather, it is recognized the measureless variety of God's gifts in nature, not only for the subsistence of man and beast, but also for pleasure and delight. Do you remember yesterday I said, I really want you guys to get this. When God says plant gardens, nourishes the body, beauty for the soul. That's what Murray's saying. That's what common grace is about. You eat a good meal, you're not just helped physically by your body getting fuel, but you delight, you enjoy, you experience food with people you love and you feel like you're more alive than you were before. It's nourishing and it's delightful. It's fuel and it's beauty. It has appreciated the endless variety of human aptitude, skill, art, and vocation. It does not spurn the most humble and menial tasks. It embraces the divine command, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with thy my might. There's a typo. Um, I remember someone once saying, it's easy sometimes to look at certain vocations as uh, more menial. So for example, you might look outside and see someone laying brick on a building. In America, you might think of someone who's pouring concrete to build a bridge or something like that. And you think, oh, you know, they, they might not be that smart, or whatever. When you think about common grace, what those people are doing, building a bridge, you're building a way for human beings to interact and to be together. You are facilitating human relationship by allowing someone to traverse a river that they might not otherwise have been able to cross in a safe and a speedy way so they can be with family or be with friends, be with people they love or get somewhere they need to go. That is remarkably profound. And so Christians should never look down on even the most menial of tasks as though it's, you know, not valuable. Anything done to help humans flourish is beautiful because it's part of God's common grace in the world. And that's how we should be discipling our people. Thoughts or questions on common grace? Do you under, does this make sense? <coughs> so any attempt to engage culture that doesn't have a healthy understanding of common grace is gonna be devoid of, its, uh, of, of the richness that it should have. So last thing I wanna say before we take a quick break, what does it mean to engage culture as those who are united to Christ? Um, somebody take a stab at defining union with Jesus for me. What, what is union with Christ? Good. You're absolutely right. I'm going to take what you've just said. It's a very academic concept, and I'm going to try to make it as simple as I possibly can. Union with Christ means Jesus dwells in me, and I dwell in him. Jesus literally, by the power of his spirit, lives inside of me. So that as I live, like Paul says, it's Christ who lives in me. That's an astounding thing. If you ever have a favorite sports team or a favorite athlete, um, you know, you watch them play and you think, oh my goodness, I'd love to be able to do what they do. And you think, okay, so in order to do that, I'm just going to watch them kick the ball or hit the ball a thousand times on YouTube. And once I've watched them a thousand times, once I've once I've really seen their example, then I'll be able to do what they do. You say, no, that's ridiculous. That's totally silly. The only way that you could perform like they perform is if you have their power, if somehow their power and skill came inside of you. Union with Christ is you have the ability to live the Christian life because Christ lives in you. 
you have a new power for living. But this cuts both ways. If union with Christ means Christ dwells in me, what's the negative side of that? It's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6. If you sleep with a harlot, you join Christ to the harlot. I mean, that is sobering language, isn't it? Paul's saying Jesus so dwells in you that even as you move towards sin, you are bringing Jesus into that space. So union with Christ is this profound reality that Jesus dwells in his people so that where they go and what they do, they both have a whole new power for Christian obedience and living, but also tremendous conviction related to sin because you're actually bringing Jesus with you into those spaces. Also, you are in Christ. So Christ dwells in you, one aspect of union. The other aspect of union, you're in Christ. So that now when God the Father looks at you, he sees the perfection of his son. Um, uh, um, Sometimes when I travel with my family, I I have a a status with a particular airline. I don't know if you know what that means, but like, you know, if if you fly with them enough, you have like perks, like you can go in the front of the line, whatever, you know, it's not that big of a deal. But the cool thing is that because I have status, when my family travels with me, they get status too. (laughs) Not that big of a deal, but you know, for the point of the illustration, they get to come to the front of the line. They get to go into the lounge. We might get moved up to the front of the plane, whatever the case might be. Why? I have status, but because they're with me, kind of in me in a certain sense, because we're one, they get status too. Union with Christ means that we get all the status and all the privileges. Union with Christ is the very center of New Testament theology. It's the heart of salvation from which all the spokes come. Justification, adoption, sanctification, glorification, all comes because of union with Christ. I love union with Christ. I want to talk about it more. But how does this relate to engaging culture? Well, think about it. What do we try to do with the stories that we consume? We said this earlier, what do the stories we consume in life do for us? They help us answer the most fundamental questions of human existence, right? Who am I? What should I do? Where am I going? Who do I belong to? For the Christian, union with Christ is to be the defining story that answers those questions to you. Who am I? I'm in Jesus. I am free from sin. I am covered by Christ's righteousness. When God looks at me, he sees Jesus and he's happy. I belong to the church. I have a family that's going to live forever. I'm on my way to God's kingdom and there's going to be a feast. So right now I work for justice and good. Union is the defining story of my life. And union shapes now how I tell stories, how I consume stories. I watch movies recognizing, if you would, that Jesus is sitting right next to me. I mean, wouldn't that change the way we consume culture? But it doesn't necessarily mean that we would always turn something off that's bad, but we would watch it soberly and differently and critically, right? We engage culture as those for whom literally Christ is right next to us. And that shapes our attitudes and our perspectives about the culture we inhabit. So, you know, we could talk a lot about the different methods of cultural engagement. I actually think the most fundamental way or the way to stay in the circle that we've just talked about is to just be so conscious of your union with Jesus. That on one hand, the story that shapes you more than any story is the story of the fact that you're in Christ. And therefore, that informs how you tell stories, what you communicate to the world, as well as how you consume stories. The fact that Jesus is right there with you. Make sense? What we want to do now is talk about worldview. And this is, I hope, making sense that culture is a bigger category than worldview in the sense that person's worldviews are shaped by the culture they consume. But worldview for most people is the thing that they experience which guides them in their life. So we want to spend some time talking about what a worldview is. You'll see that there's a lot of similarity between the conversation we've had about culture as story, but there are some differences or you might say amplifications. Um, Right off the bat, I'll just say my conviction, especially for Christians living in cities, is that your job as a pastor is worldview discipleship. It's to help people have the worldview of the Bible rather than the worldview of some other story or set of stories. 
part of the, re well, I'll, we'll talk about this more in a second. Okay, so worldview discipleship, that's really what we're after. So what is a worldview? How would we define it? Um, a couple of uh, definitions and uh, different ways of talking about it. So one, it's the comprehensive framework of one's basic belief about things. Uh, others describe worldview as the story or the set of stories that you understand your life unfolding in. My favorite definition of worldview is thinking about it as a pair of glasses that you wear that shapes how you see everything. If I put on a pair of glasses and they're red, what's everything gonna look like? Red. And I'll say, oh, look at that red chair. And someone else will say, what red chair? And I'll say, that one. And they'll say, what red chair? And we're almost unable to have a conversation because we haven't talked about our worldviews, the way we see things, the way we understand things. So for me, that's the best definition of worldview. It's the lenses or the glasses that you wear that shape how you see the world. Everybody has a worldview. There is not a person on planet Earth who doesn't have some worldview. Most people would not have an answer if they were asked what their worldview is, but their basic beliefs emerge quickly enough when they're faced with practical emergencies, current political issues, or convictions that clash with their own. In other words, Crisis often reveals worldview. When life is hard, you very quickly learn what is most important to you and what values shape what you want to be and what you want to do. Everyone has a worldview, however articulate or inarticulate they may be in expressing it. Having a worldview is simply a part of being an adult human being. A person's worldview is shaped for them factors and influences outside of their control, especially when they're young, and shaped by them, their own choices, actions, and beliefs. Um, if you experience trauma, that's gonna shape you, right? It's gonna shape everything about you. Uh, if you experience incredible generosity, I remember when my family and I were younger, we were moving homes, my mom had just been divorced, my dad had an affair and left. We were in a hard way and someone let us live in their house for free. Big, huge house for like six months. That form of generosity shaped me. It profoundly shaped my worldview. So worldview doesn't just happen because you decide to discover a worldview. Worldview happens because of the things that shape you hard things, good things, sad things, joyful things. Therefore, we can say worldview is a matter of discipleship. Your job as a pastor is to help somebody have the worldview of the Bible, the lenses of scripture, the lenses of Jesus to shape the way they view everything in this world. And that means both helping them create that worldview for themselves but also creating communities in which they can experience the Christian worldview, which is certainly stuff that happens on Sundays in worship, but it also means inviting people into spaces to serve the poor. It means creating communities where true generosity and hospitality are taking place. Those are all ways that we help people have a worldview shaped by the Bible. Top of page 20, why does worldview matter? You can't make sense of your life or the world around you without a grand story. I've already given you the quote that's there. But second, the way that people answer the biggest questions in their life will depend on the worldview that is operative in their life. If a young person is trying to decide, do I move far away to go to a great college or do I stay home and make sure that I'm taking care of my parents? If a person, a young person is faced with that question, how are they gonna answer it? largely dependent on their worldview. Are they wanting to go and achieve and succeed? Maybe the thought is if I go and make it, then I can provide for my family better off in the future. Or fundamentally, I have a responsibility right now to take care of mom and dad because they took care of me. That worldview determines the answer to the question. So Al Walter says, our worldview functions as our guide to life. A worldview, even when it's unconscious, unarticulated, functions like a compass or a roadmap. It orients us to the world at large, gives us a sense of what's up and down, what's right and what's wrong in the confusion of events and phenomena that confront us. He says later, 
One of the unique characteristics of human beings is that we cannot do without the kind of orientation that a worldview gives. We need guidance because we are inescapably creatures with responsibility who by nature are incapable of holding purely arbitrary opinions or making entirely unprincipled decisions. Can't live without a worldview. Can't answer life's big questions without a worldview. Now, I wanna give you an example of this that's kind of funny, <clears throat> but it makes the point pretty powerfully. So, Alistair McIntyre, I mentioned him earlier, is a philosopher taught at Notre Dame in America, and he has a great book that isn't necessarily a Christian book, but it interacts with a lot of these themes. So he gives this illustration. He says, imagine that you're standing at a bus stop waiting for the bus, and all of a sudden, a young man comes next to you and looks at you and says, someone you've never seen before, this young man says, the name of the common wild duck is Historionicus Historionicus. And then he walks away. McIntyre says, there is no problem understanding the meaning of the sentence he uttered. You understand the sentence. The name of the common wild duck in Latin and scientifically is Historionicus Historionicus. McIntyre says the problem is how to answer the question, what is he doing in uttering it? So you have this encounter, the name of the common wild duck is Historionicus Historionicus. McIntyre says, you know what that means, but you don't know why he's saying it. You don't know what it means in context. You don't know where it's coming from. What is this man doing in making that statement? McIntyre says there's at least three possible scenarios. One, he mistook you for someone who yesterday approached him at the library and said, do you know the name of the common duck in Latin? So he was following up, giving you an answer to his question. Or maybe he's a spy waiting at a prearranged rendezvous point and uttering the chosen code sentence that will identify him to his contact. Or maybe he's overcoming paralyzing shyness and he's stepping out of his shell just trying to start up conversation with anyone he can by uttering whatever comes to his mind. In other words, the only way to make sense of the statement is to try to understand it within a story that gives it meaning. McIntyre says, in each case, the utterance becomes intelligible only by finding its place in a narrative. McIntyre concludes, I can only answer the question, what am I to do? If I can answer the prior question of what story or stories do I find myself a part of? It's a powerful illustration. And when you think of the implications of it, it radically transforms discipleship. When you call somebody to Bible reading, or when you call somebody to be generous with their stuff, or when you call somebody to not be promiscuous in their sexuality, sometimes we think that if we just make the statements, people will get what we mean. But actually, what if we really need to do is uncover the worldviews which help somebody make sense of the statement? What if our statements to people don't make sense because the worldviews they have make those statements unintelligible. You see, discipleship isn't just giving people truth, it's helping them unpack and understand the truth in a comprehensive way that includes worldview or story formation. So what is the worldview then supposed to be for the Christian? The worldview of the Christian, anybody seeking to live as Jesus' disciple, our worldview is meant to be shaped by scripture, the overarching story of the Bible. We're to be shaped and tested by scripture. The Bible provides a worldview both in the narrow sense that it defines the right way to understand and answer life's biggest questions, but also in the broader sense that Christians are to approach all of their life thinking out the implications of scripture's story for their whole life. I just want to stay there for a minute and unpack that. Isn't it amazing how few of life's biggest questions are answered in scripture? So Sammy's going to move to Toronto, Lord willing. Um, 
Scripture says a lot about serving God, um, vocation, being a pastor. But if Sammy was wrestling, should I stay in Addis and be a pastor here, or should I go to Toronto and be a pastor? Where in the Bible could he turn to get an answer to that question? I think we're, we understand, right? Even though there are funny examples, the answer is there is no place you can turn in scripture to answer that question. It's wisdom or it's worldview. Um, when someone comes to you and says, oh, I'm thinking about marrying so-and-so. You say, is that person a Christian? Yeah, they're a Christian. Do you guys get along? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should I marry them? It's a wisdom call. It's a worldview call. Uh, what does it look like to see renewal in your industry. Maybe you work for a company that builds buildings in Addis. Maybe you work in a finance office somewhere in the city. What does renewal look like in your office? How do you advance God's values in your workplace? The Bible gives us a lot of principles that help us answer those questions, but it doesn't give us a roadmap for how to do it. What the Bible does is it gives us a worldview that we immerse ourselves in and then we go into our world and we live out that story. So here's an example. <clears throat> N.T. Wright, I don't know if you've heard of N.T. Wright, he's a scholar in the UK, he's written a lot about the resurrection, really helpful stuff there. But he has a spot in one of his books where he says, imagine for a moment that archeologists somewhere in the UK discovered a never before found uh, manuscript of a Shakespearean play. So a new play we've never seen, right? Like that, all the great plays, we have them. We found a brand new one. We knew it was from Shakespeare. But the problem was we only found four acts rather than the fifth one. So we have four acts, but the fifth act is the culminating act. It's the final act. N.T. Wright says, in that instance, what do you do? There's two options. Well, there's three. One is you could say, because it's incomplete, we're never going to put the play on for performance. The second thing you could do is ask somebody who's really informed, you know, who knows Shakespeare really well, to write out a fifth act. And forever now we have a new fifth act that Shakespeare himself didn't write. Or third, what you could do is you could find highly trained Shakespearean actors and you could have them immerse themselves in the first four acts of that story. They know all of Shakespeare's other corpus. They know the first four acts of this new story. And then you give them the freedom to work out a fifth act for themselves. What do you think should be done? Never do the play, write a fifth act that forever binds that story to that fifth act, or give the first four acts to highly trained Shakespearean actors who are immersed in Shakespeare's world and then let them work it out for themselves. So what N.T. Wright is trying to say in giving that illustration is that the story of the Bible is more like that third act where Christians are called to immerse themselves in the worldview of scripture, but are not given specific directions about how every part of their life is supposed to unfold. What they're supposed to do instead is so immerse themselves in the story of God that when they go out into the world to buy coffee or to get married or to go to college or to have kids, they live out the implications of the story of God because they've so immersed themselves in it. But they've not been given prescriptive direction about what they're supposed to do in every instance. Now, let me be clear, I'm not talking about sin. If someone comes to you and is like, I'm really feeling led today to go and rob that bank. You have really clear guidance that you can give people about that in their discipleship. You can say, that's a really stupid idea. <laughs> But when people ask you the questions about, I don't know how to live out my faith at my job, or, you know, I, I, in New York, I, uh, you get, have you guys heard of Broadway, like the theater, you know, like where people act on, in Broadway? I remember, uh, true story, I'm like a new pastor at Redeemer, and this couple comes up to me, married couple, really strong members of the church, and the woman comes up to me and she says, we'd like to talk to you. The couple's together. She says, we'd like to talk to you because I've just landed a job in this incredible Broadway play. And it's like the dream job. She's like the star role in this Broadway play. And she says, but you know, we're recently married 
and this play is going to have me romantically kissing some other man every single night of the week and on Saturday twice a day because <laughs> they do the show twice. And so she and her husband are there with me and she's saying, I'm a Christian. I want to honor my husband, but I want to take this role. It's the dream. It's, the, it's what I've been working for all my life. So pastor, can I do it? Like, can I take this play, this job, you know? Can I take this role? And what you realize quickly is, well, scripture says a lot about marriage and sexuality. It also says a lot about engaging the culture and bringing faith to work, but it doesn't answer that question, at least not directly. So what we had to do is we had to sit and pray and process and wrestle with scripture, get some feedback from the community, talk to other leaders in that space and figure out what does discipleship look like to Jesus in this moment? recognizing that actually for that couple, it ended up leaning one way, but for another couple, it could end up being very different for situations that are specific to them. That's what I'm trying to help you guys see. Now, that's a pretty extreme example. But worldview formation matters because your people are going to be in spaces all the time where they don't know exactly what they should do because the Bible chapter and verse doesn't tell them this is what you should do in this moment. So what you wanna do is help them so experience the story of God that they just live in the world as people shaped by Jesus' story. John Bunyan used to say, or actually, that's not true. John Owen used to say of John Bunyan, he was so filled with the Bible that if you cut him anywhere, he would bleed scripture. That's what we want. We want people who are so immersed in the story of God that we can't live in the world without being people who live out our Christian values. Matters a great deal. If I were to round out this conversation, what should the worldview of the Christian be? It should be humble and unassuming. It should be appropriately shared. It should be included in the modern world, meaning it's legitimate, it's not mythical, it's not primitive, it's not ancient. It's global in scale. The way of Jesus doesn't belong to any single time or culture. And it's holistic in scope. A worldview that doesn't encompass your whole life is not a Christian worldview because the gospel is for every part of your life. So if the gospel is for every part of your life, then your Christian worldview should be about your parenting and about your banking and about your church life and about your hobbies. Everything should be informed by the story of God. I think a lot of people have worldviews that would be very hard for them to articulate. So I'll give you an example. Um, <clears throat> in a place like New York City or London, I'll use a, a, a pretty obvious example. Um, the idea that anybody would tell someone else how to use their sexuality, whether it's sex outside of marriage or same-sex relationships, the idea that anybody would tell you how you can use your sexuality is seen as repulsive. It's seen as oppressive. For me to say to you, sex is for one man and one woman in the context of marriage. They would say, that's a primitive way of thinking. So when I press somebody on that, um, and I say, well, why do you think that way? Why do you think that sex should be expressed however you want to express it, whatever that means? They would say maybe something like, well, I don't know, it's just this is right, it's just how it is, it's just how it should be. And what they're struggling to do is uncover the worldview that gives sense to that belief because it's a belief and it's actually a pretty modern one. Most people throughout most of world history did not believe that sexuality was to be used however you wanted it. So class, I'm asking you, and we've talked a lot about it over the past few days, what's the worldview or what's the story that makes a person feel like using their sexuality however they want is totally plausible. What's the post-enlightenment story that everyone has imbibed that makes us feel like we should be able to use our sexuality however we want to? Expressive individualism. Of course, if that's your dominating story, it would make sense to you that sexuality is to be used as a means of self-expression and self-gratification, not as a way to honor God or serve another person or to fit in with your community. So what I'm trying to say is most people 
are very conscious of the worldview they have in the sense that they feel passionate about the implications of that worldview. But most people in London, if I start talking to them about expressive individualism, they have no idea what I'm talking about. But so what I try to do in sermons, so if I'm preaching on a topic like this, what I wanna say is now, I know for many of you, this seems really strange, but here's why it seems strange. And then I'll say, because we now live in a culture that tells us we should look within to find our identity. That's called expressive individualism. If you don't believe me, just watch Frozen, you know, and I'll say something like that. And all of a sudden they start to say, oh my gosh, yeah, we've been formed. We're products of a culture. We're products of a story that is, um, I'll give you another example. This may not be as true here, but this is amazing. Uh, recently I read a book that was talking about capitalism and the idea that, um, uh, you know, a, play, uh, play, a place like America, for example, um, basically took advantage of people's impulse to be greedy and to feel peer pressure and created systems of credit that allowed people to spend more money than they actually had to buy things that they didn't need because they knew that if we created enough marketing and advertising, people would do that. That's, uh, you know, so what feels like normal to a lot of people, you know, going into credit, buying things you don't really need, buying the latest gadget even though you have a perfectly good one, that kind of behavior is a function of a story in which people, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 years ago were saying we can capitalize on people's propensity for peer pressure and greed. Point is very simply, most people who are overspending wouldn't be conscious of that larger story, but it's there. And your job as a pastor is to help people uncover those grand narratives that are shaping their lives in very profound ways.